Hey, thanks for dropping by Spin Industries uh, Speed Shed. Uh, I'm Drew. Um, today I'm going to be making some uh, some new wheels for David Van Erd. Uh, if you don't know who David is, he's a multiple uh, NL Crit Series champion, a serial race winner, um, and he's a Red Hook Crit winner too. Uh, he's a seriously quick guy. Um, he, he already rides a lot of wheels that we made for him. He wants a special new pair for his gravel bike. So I'm going to build them today and I thought it would be a great opportunity to maybe uh, show some of that to you guys. Okay, so first things first, um, I've already laced this front wheel up. Um, this is going to be a uh, disc hub build uh, for David's gravel bike. And um, his bike uses quick releases front and rear so uh, I've got this hub set up for 12 millimeter through axles so the first step is for me to convert this hub to a quick release uh, you just pull these off um, with a little bit of brute force and they pop out so that's the 12 mil through axle end and in its place we're going to put on the quick release through axle end and it just literally pops into here with a little click done do the same thing on the other side then we get to work so the very first step of making a great wheel is to uh, rule out any eccentricity in the axle uh, all axles have some kind of eccentricity no axle on any bike anywhere on the planet or on any machine of any kind uh, is truly perfect it's just not possible within the tolerance range that we work to uh, when we make components and what that means is that if you rotate the axle in your bike in the dropouts um, you'll find the eccentricity of the axle will result in some lateral movement at the rim and so we're going to dial that out when we make a wheel we don't want to be taking this wheel in and out of our workstation here uh, without knowing where the dead center of the axle is so we make a mark so if you've already bought a pair of our wheels you'll find that every time you open up the box and you look at the hubs um, you'll find a little white mark on one of the axle ends on both both hubs um, and that's how i define the center of the axle eccentricity it means that every time this wheel goes in and out of the rig uh, it's always replaced with the mark bottom dead okay or dead bottom so here you go I'm doing the mark now so that gives me that gives me my center you can't see it because it's on the other side As you can see right now that this wheel is not very stiff uh, and that's because I've just laced it up so that means the spokes have no tension in whatsoever so we're gonna wind the tension up now boring long process so I'm gonna turn this into a time-lapse and we'll come back when we've when we've done more Okay, so the wheel is now in the building apparatus. Uh, it's extremely accurate. Uh, I use this for all wheel builds. It, uh, it measures on these clocks down here, which you can't quite see. Uh, it measures in 0.05 millimeter increments. Um, so that's the accuracy that we can build wheels to. Uh, we're looking for about a quarter of a millimeter uh, total, total movement in our, all our wheels. Although on a disc build, um, lateral movement uh, is not so important because the braking is done at the disc and you don't have a caliper running close to the rim edge um, so actually building disc wheels gives us an opportunity to build a stronger better balance wheel without having to worry so much about the absolute center position of the rim or the side to side uh, wobble or run out as we call it okay so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, set this to a nice comfortable working angle um, I've got two clocks down here which you can't see which measure the lateral run out and they also measure the radial run out so that's the the roundness and the lateral trueness of the wheel and I can monitor that throughout the build and the very first step on any wheel build is if there is an imbalance of spoke tensions um, which means that a hub is not centered and really the only truly centered hubs are front road hubs and track hubs um, but for a disc front road hub like this one, uh, there's an offset of the flanges um, to allow space for a disc braking rotor to be fitted. And so that means that 
this the spokes on the rotor side are going to be at a higher tension than the spokes on the non-disc side um, because they're longer and because of the offset um, you need to balance that to make this wheel centered and so the spokes that are at a lower tension are much more vulnerable to vibrations and vibrations tends to unscrew the spokes at the nipple here so uh, I just did a quick round uh, with a light dab of permabond in all of those nipples so we put that on we give the wheel a quick spin in the stand um, just to encourage that glue to to run itself deep into the threads and we get good locking ability I'm going to switch back to time lapse now I basically was just tightening up all these nipples to you know a fairly high tension already and each stage of revolution I did I stopped to put on these thick rubber gloves and you might have seen me um, doing this but probably didn't know what I was doing I was basically taking groups of four spokes pairs the ones that run parallel to each other and I was squeezing them down really hard which what that does is it relieves any built up stresses in the rim and the nipple and the threads and the spoke and the hub uh, and it also beds everything in and pulls everything into the center it's a really important part of the making of a really good strong long lasting wheel when a wheel is built properly and fully stress relieved that's how it basically stays for the rest of its life uh, unless you do something horrible like crash i've got the basic tension in here now i'm now starting to wind the tension on spoke by spoke and starting to look at the trueness and roundness of the wheel using my gauges here you can't really see them where you are here's the lateral gauge over on this side and here's the radial gauge here i'll be you you'll be seeing me looking at that turning the wheel backwards and forwards it's very boring so we're going to speed it up okay just stopping again uh you might have spotted me using this which is a very very accurate tension meter and you see that I've started just to get an idea of the sort of tensions that we've put into the wheel already and you can hear that I'm using my uh, one of my guitar playing fingernails to play the wheel I'm plucking the spokes I hope you can hear this spoke has a higher tone than that one this tells me without having to measure it with a tension meter that this spoke is at a much higher tension than that spoke and it still is so I'm gonna relax that one and this is quite normal at this stage in the wheel build tone by the way is not a, a, a really good guarantee of even tension because like every other component in your bike each component has a manufacturing tolerance and the spokes have quite a wide tolerance on their thickness this is a this is a super light disc specific double butted stainless steel spoke um, it has a middle section that's only 1.6 mil thick but that's the nominal thickness if we measure these we might find a whole range from 1.7 down to sometimes 1.3 um, that has a big effect on the tone if you play guitar or, or any other stringed instrument you'll know that your thicker strings um, sound much more bass than the thin strings incidentally when I tighten these spokes at this tension it's very important that I hold on to the spoke as well as turn the nipple why is that it allows me to feel the amount of twist that the spoke is is is, is happening and it also then gives me a good guide of how little to re how much or little to release the the, the screwdriver in effect the spoke wrench after tightening to undo that twist if you don't undo the twist in the spokes they'll undo themselves the next time you ride the, the bike and then your wheels fall apart in general the thinner and lighter the spoke the more easy they are to twist so the more dangerous they are to build with the thicker the spoke the less twist and actually the stiffer the spoke is We're not too bothered about getting very even tension at this stage of the build because we're going to do that right at the end when we've done final stress relieving we're going to go around and check for any unevenness in the tension balance 
and try to correct that because an evenly balanced tension throughout the wheel uh, is a strong wheel. So now I'm going to center the wheel. I'm going to do a little trick with my rig here. That means I don't have to use a centering gauge or anything. I'm just going to assume that that is the center and I'm going to reset my clocks here to read zero at this position. Okay, and now I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the wheel out of the rig, okay, and I'm going to turn it over, okay, I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to remember the little pen mark I put at the start. I've made sure that that's bottom dead center. That way I dial out any eccentricity that exists in this axle. And so I maintain consistent, true radial and lateral readings down here on these clocks. So now I'm going to check the center again, and we find that it's not in the same position it was. It's now about five millimeters away. So I'm going to halve that distance and reset my clock to half that distance, and that will automatically determine where the true center of this uh, axle and wheel combination is. Half of five. It's two and a half, so we're talking millimetres here at the moment, not fractions of a millimetre, but whole millimetres. So I've just reset the centre uh, to two and a half. So that means that without any checking, I was two and a half mil off centre just by doing it by ear and by hand. So now that I've found the centre, I'm going to continue tensioning and truing the wheel, concentrating on this side right now, as well as this side later on. Just pause there. I've just done another uh, stress relief, and uh, this is just to show you where this wheel is. So this gauge here, this clock here, is measuring the radial uh, movement or runout in this wheel, and you can see it's moving about a little bit. But what that's actually telling us is, I don't know if we can focus in on here, um, but this is a movement of one millimeter. Okay and we're right now we're within about 0.25 of a millimeter of up and down movement in the wheel that's movement up and down from the axle okay and then this gauge over here is measuring the uh, lateral run out or the lateral wobble or what many people still call you know buckle in their wheels and this is showing this is the center here at zero and uh, it's showing that we're uh, a few fractions of a millimeter this is one millimeter by the way here's one millimeter uh, in this direction and here is one millimeter in that direction. So we're about this this gauge these these two gauges on either side Are the flags if you like they're showing the maximum extent and you see the needle in the middle moving about as we rotate the wheel That's showing the extent of the wobble which at the moment is about just over uh, almost a millimeter and a half of total movement. Okay, so that's where we're at at this stage We're now going to dial all that out and make this wheel uh, as balanced and as accurately uh, True as we possibly can uh, at the end of the day It's you can debate what's more important absolute trueness or or balance if you want your wheel to last for a long time and be, be as strong as it can be it's actually better to be uh, a little bit out of true or maybe a little bit off-centered but with a much better balance of tension throughout the spokes and anyway, we're going to switch back to time lapse now and we'll come back and look at that again uh, when we finish but uh, on this gauge here we're doing pretty well already so uh, I've just turned the wheel around you might have seen me do that um, and that's because I want to check um, the centering again um, because the first time we had a big uh, we were a long way out, we were two and a half mil out of centre. Um, so I did a very quick rough determination of the true centre. This time I wanted to do a really accurate one. Uh, and this time I found that uh, I was uh, 0.2, 0 0.2 of one millimetre off centre. So I'm going to correct that now uh, by realigning the, the gauge to 0.1 of a millimetre off centre at the valve hole. The valve always my reference here, so I'm now. I now know the center, the true center of this wheel, um, to within 0 0.05 of one millimeter accuracy, thanks to these uh, very accurate gauges that I'm using. Incidentally, you see when I rotate the wheel here um, to check it, to look at the true, to do all these things, uh, I'm not 
yanking it, spinning it really hard and fast. Um, that's because I'm looking for accuracy and uh, to do that you need to be slow movement. Anything that's fast uh, will exaggerate the true movement in the wheel. A really important thing if, you, if you're serious about making great wheels is that you use a really solid uh, wheel building station. Um, if you have one of these uh, uh, home workshop ones you find that when you rotate the wheel the whole station is vibrating left and right. How are you meant to get accurate results if your rig is not rock solid. This thing is made out of solid brass, really heavy. Um, I have it mounted onto a really heavy uh, wood uh, platform, but you need to have your rig solid mounted. If it's a solid rig like this, it needs to be solid mounted to continue that accuracy. And uh, accuracy is, is really important in road wheels with rim braking, not so important with disc braking like these. Um, but what is super important is to be able to measure that accuracy so that you can balance the tensions within all the spokes as evenly as possible. And that's as evenly on each side and as evenly on the other side. Remember that the two sides of this wheel, because it's offset the hub to allow for the rotor, will have different tensions. Um, they will carry different loads depending on where the spoke is, disc side or non-disc side. And at the rear, drive side or non-drive side uh, and this is important to understand okay and it's always the spokes with the least tension that the, are the ones you have to give most attention to um, because they're the ones that will over the life of a wheel will have the most movement in them because they're not locked down between the rim and the hub as hard um, and it's that little bit of movement every revolution of the wheel um, that fatigue spokes so that's quite often why you find the spoke that goes first in any pair of wheels is the non-drive side rear spoke or a spoke from the non-drive side of the rear because that's the spoke with the least tension overall and so it goes through the biggest fatigue cycles in your wheels. Always a good idea to have a few of those spare. Okay, you can watch our video about how to get home on a broken spoke and how to fix it yourself. That's a really useful one. I'll try to remember to put a link down below. Okay, back to the uh, grindstone and we'll try to finish this wheel up now and I'll show you how accurate it is at the end. Remember, every time you uh, tension one spoke, you're actually not tensioning one spoke. You're actually affecting the tension on all of the spokes in the wheel. All the forces in a wheel, there's a huge amount of force in this wheel pulling the rim into the hub in all directions. And when you increase this tension on this spoke here, for example, it also increases the tension on this spoke opposite, and it increases slightly less each time as it goes around till it gets to about 90 degrees, almost a zero effect, but it still has some effect. And also, when spokes are in cross pairs like these, uh, affect changing the tension on one of the pairs affects the tension on the other. So you always have to recheck that every time you're doing it time I make an adjustment and rotate the wheel fully, full rotation, to see now where the next run out is. And it's here. We've got a slight run out onto this side. This gauge down here, the lateral one, tells me that we need to increase tension rather than decrease it because it's, it's below the average. And we can hear that this spoke here is the culprit. It needs to be a tighter. And this one does too. So I'm using a combination of plucking, using a combination of uh, tone and visual verification on my dials to see whether they are needing, whether they have too much tension in them or too little. And then tightening or loosening accordingly. So we're pretty close to perfection here. Uh, I'll just show that to you, if I can, if I can do it without dropping the camera. Okay, so here we are. This is the this is the uh, lateral. Sorry, this is the radial. This is the up and down movement in the wheel when it rotates. So you can see now we're at something like around 0.2 of one millimeter of total uh, variation in one revolution. 
And if we come over to the uh, lateral gauge here, uh, you can see that we're pretty accurate laterally. And remember, this is a disc wheel, so it doesn't matter so much. Um, but if this was a rim braking wheel, uh, you'd be very happy to ride that. You wouldn't feel any uh, rubbing on your brake blocks, no matter how close you set them. Because what we're looking at there is a movement, a total movement of, let's just close those up and try again. Okay, we're looking at a total lateral movement of um, just about 0 0.06, 0 0.07, certainly less than one tenth of one millimeter uh, laterally. So I'm just gonna put the camera back for the moment. Put it back here. Um, I'm basically just going to stress relieve this now, come back and check this again, do any final tweaks, and there we're going to have a finished wheel. And by the way, every time we do stress relieving, remember that's when we're grabbing, with the thick gloves on, we're grabbing adjacent pairs of spokes. Um, every time we do that, we're testing the rim and the hub and the spoke and the nipple for strength because we're putting a lot of extra force into the wheel that wouldn't normally be there. But when we do this stress relieving, which we're going to do now by squeezing these as hard as you can, you can hear them pinging. That's just the crosses of the spokes uh, rubbing together. But what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to rip these spokes out of the hub and out of the rim. And if we have a defective rim, then we're going to find out by doing this because we're going to pull one of these spokes through uh, the nipple hole. Um, likewise, if you've got a defective spoke or nipple, it's going to break under these loads. So this is quite a painful process. This is something I do a lot. It's why you have to wear gloves like these. And uh, after one week of work, they look like that. Um, so I have a big supply of these uh, and they're triple layer gloves. They're really thick. Um, if we're using bladed spokes, they're even even more gnarly to to do this. But anyway, the good news is the wheel has held up. I didn't feel a lot of movement there. That noise you hear, by the way, that's the spokes at the cross. Black spokes are very prone to that noise, by the way. If ever you hear your wheels creaking, um, the easiest solution is to go take them out of your bike or turn your bike upside down and just um, do this click them back into their natural crossing point, like that. Okay, you hear that once I've done that, all the creaking stops, they're back in their little slots. If you still have creaking, a little bit of WD-40 at the crosses won't hurt, but don't get it on your brake tracks, that's not good. Okay, let's check and see what effect the de-stressing had on the trueness. Um, if we done a good job up until now, we shouldn't see too much difference. Um, but this is why de-stressing is very important, because if you don't take those stresses out, you've, you've basically read false information here. Um, so after de-stressing, we've now got, we had about 0 0.6, sorry, 0 0.06, six hundredths of a millimeter of movement before. Um, we've now got around about, 11 hundredths of movement, which is still well within uh, the tolerance that uh, that I'm happy to let these wheels go out at. And uh, on the radial tolerance, we're still down very, very tight at about 12 uh, hundredths of one millimeter movement through the revolutions. So I'll bring the camera over and you can see that for yourself. So this is after stressing or de-stressing. So we've now got that kind of range of movement. Uh, on the radial and on the lateral, it's the same. So, uh, so that's that means. So doing that stress relief uh, not only relieved any stresses and uh, released the stress, uh, which if it affected the movement here, uh, we could then correct. We could find the spoke that's loosened up during the stress cycle and retension it. Um, but when you get to this stage, um, where you've been doing a lot of stress relief all the way through the build, and we get to the end part, and there's not big dramatic changes in the tolerance, um, you know you've done a good job. Um, also, doing stress relief helps to remove any final slight twisting in the spokes. You, you can't ride on twisted spokes because they will untwist themselves. 
every single revolution of the wheels. In other words, they'll unscrew themselves from the nipples and you end up with a, what you probably will think is a broken spoke, but in fact it's the spoke that's de-screwed itself, unscrewed itself. Um, and so uh, you, you just need to do that back up again, basically. Um, but that gives you an indication of a wheel that's either been very stressed or, or the builder has missed um, doing the best job he could on de-stressing. I'm guilty of that also. You know, I'm, I'm, every day I make a lot of wheels for a lot of customers around the world. And um, sometimes maybe I do one less stress relief than, than I should. I try not to, um, but it has happened. And one or two of my customers have uh, had a spoke undo uh, and let me know in no uncertain terms uh, about it. And I apologize to you guys. You know who you are for that. But also sometimes spokes can undo themselves as well. Um, even when you've built a wheel really well, especially if you don't use some of this stuff. Uh, like I say, I use this on the non-drive on the rear and on the uh, non-disc side on the front. Um, and I don't use it really where any wheel is completely balanced, like a front row wheel where you have symmetric forces left and right, uh, or a track hub front or rear. You don't really need this as extra security because there are all the spokes on both sides take equal amount of work on board. It's only when you have some spokes that do a lot of work, they're not the problem ones. Um, it's the ones that are just there to guide the centering of the wheel. They're the ones that are under very little tension uh, and as a consequence, find it very easy to undo themselves. So if your wheels do that, you know maybe next time you're looking for wheels, get them made by someone that knows what they're doing and cares about cyclists. Okay, we're pretty much done here. All we've got to do now is give this a clean up and uh, make the rear uh, and ready to send off to David. Um, I think he's going to like them. Uh, I know I do. In fact, I, I've got my own disc bike uh, that's in build now. It's a gravel bike, adventure bike. Uh, I've been meaning to build it up for all, over a year now. These would look great. I originally had an orange Chris King uh, inset headset in them. These uh, limited edition Santucci Crit Hunter graphics would have looked great in my bike, but these are David's wheels.